A section of this video is sponsored by PCBWay. More on them later in the video. Okay, after the disaster in the last episode where I smashed my glass build plate, I made an entirely new heated bed, and I guess I'll have to be a little more careful from now on. Today I want to go over all the lessons I learned building my Unipolar 3D printer, and all the upgrades I want to do to it in order to have it spit out decent parts. Remember, the Benchy looked like a pug, and print quality reminds a lot of what you'd expect from $50 worth of 3D printer, even though I won't stop before it rivals the print quality of most entry-level printers out there. We're gonna cover all the juicy engineering details you'll definitely want to see before building your own cheap 3D printer. Or, in other words, I'm going to complain about this thing until by the end of the video, you'll be surprised it even works as well as it does. And if afterward there's still some time left, we're gonna start printing parts to improve it. First off, I want to address something I knew plenty of you guys would suggest. And oh boy did you deliver. Install Clipper on it! And I'm afraid to dash your hope. I won't do it. At least not for now. You see, I grew up on Windows, and I have such a hard time doing even the simplest things like installing programs on Linux, and while Clipper looks like something I could do following a tutorial to the letter, if there's anything deviating from the tutorial, and I don't have somebody to tell me exactly what to type into the freaking terminal to make it do whatever black magic it does, I'm screwed. So to me, it's not worth the effort. Marlin works just fine for what I needed to do, and as you'll see shortly, I have more pressing issues to solve on this printer than what fancy software it runs on. And in case you wondered, Repetier Host happened to be in the package manager of this OS. I really only had to click install, so no effort there. Anyway, let's talk about my mistakes, starting with the petty ones first, the linear rails. If you use plastic rollers on aluminum from the hardware store, make sure to use the anodized stuff, because raw aluminum like I used is so incredibly soft, it'll wear down pretty quick. Just look at how much aluminum dust gathered on my plastic rollers after just a few hours of this printer running. So even though the non-anodized aluminum may be a little bit cheaper, saving those few bucks will come back to bite you later once you have to replace them. Some Thing that was not a mistake is my compliant mechanism spring-loaded rollers. In fact, I think it's the only thing that makes using wood for the primary structural part of the linear rail even feasible. So if your design depends on two edges on a piece of wood being parallel, I highly recommend you make two of the rollers spring-loaded, because in woodworking, straight and parallel do not exist. Let's take this strip that was cut on the table saw. It should be parallel, right? Well, nope. 30.14. 30.10 and 30.2. And that's still impressively accurate for a table saw cut. My linear rails on this printer are less accurate. Plus, what those springs will also do is buffer any expansion and contraction of the wood caused by relative humidity. Otherwise, your rails might be very stiff in summer and almost falling off in winter. I get pretty drastic changes in humidity in this workshop over the course of a year, and I have not had that problem with this printer. Next up, undoubtedly, the Exuder. You cannot use a 28BYJ48 for a Bowden Exuder. It simply doesn't have enough power to push filament through a Bowden tube this long without losing steps. Either use a bigger motor, or what I'm gonna do, make it a direct drive Exuder without any Bowden tube whatsoever, with a filament spool sitting on top of the printer, feeding in directly, just like on the Prusa i3. Staying on topic of separate motors, if you use random ones salvaged from e-waste, test them properly before releasing videos about building a 3D printer with them on the internet. I didn't do my homework and was caught off guard when I found out that these cheaply manufactured stepper motors are incapable of micro-stepping. I found them in an old electronic typewriter, and my entire linear motion system using the gear reduction they came with relied on micro-stepping to get down to a reasonable resolution as basically does every other 3D printer out there if you do the math, albeit without gearing. So now I'm kind of stuck with my 3D printer moving a tenth of a millimeter per step, which is an order of magnitude more than it should. The way I'm going to solve this is by installing lead screws, as I've no doubt you've heard me mention at least once at this point. But some people in the comments were apparently more concerned about lead screws making this printer awfully slow, which they'll totally do, than the missing resolution. So let me try to explain why I cannot possibly use this printer with a resolution that low. Now, micro-stepping is such a can of worms, I don't fully understand it. I think very few people actually do, but I'll try to give my two cents on what in my understanding is going on here. 
On a hypothetical standard 3D printer, NEMA 17 with 200 steps per revolution, running a 20 tooth pulley, it moves the print head by roughly 0.2 millimeters per full step on the motor. Simple math, just divide the circumference of your pulley by the amount of steps per revolution. Since my motors are particularly bad, I need to include the gear reduction that's on there to get even close, but ultimately it works out to just about the same. So why does it work there, but not on my printer? Because to the NEMA 17, you then usually apply 1 16th micro stepping, which effectively chops up those 0.2 millimeter steps into 16 tiny ones of just over a hundredth of a millimeter each. Amazing, you suddenly get 16 times the resolution. Except it doesn't really work. Because micro steps are really just virtual steps, the controller telling the motor to go to micro step 3 out of 16 doesn't necessarily make the motor go there exactly, but it'll come to rest somewhere in the vicinity. Depending on the load on the rotor, it might even be quite a ways off. But at the end of the day, that doesn't even matter because micro steps work just as well for smoothing motion. If you try to print a small curve, your full step position of the motors might be here and here and here and here and here, and in full step mode, that's that's exactly where it'll go, but with microstepping basically adding all those tiny little waypoints in between, even if it doesn't exactly hit them, it still manages to sail past those full step detent points instead of snapping onto them like it would in full step mode, and with the addition of inertia it'll smooth out the motion into a curve that at least closely resembles the one you were trying to draw. Without microstepping though, all the controller can do is pick the full step positions closest to where it should be and hope for the best. In other words, microstepping doesn't actually increase the resolution per se, at least you shouldn't count on it for anything past 8th steps I've read, but it does help the motor navigate in between those big full step stopping points for a result that, to all intents and purposes, should only be described as good enough. You see, it's really weird. And because it's a purely physical issue of my motors not being able to retain the rotor in between those full step detent points, I do not believe any amount of input shaping or other clipper magic is going to fix this. Like, if I set those motors to microstepping, they just wait until all the 16 microsteps are over and then do one full step. To demonstrate this, I printed a pretty standard 20 tooth pulley earlier, and you can see it's not fully formed. Some of the teeth are almost inexistent, and others it seems like it did them half the time, and half the time it didn't. So overall, for small pulleys and gears, the result is pretty unusable. And yes, due to inertia, I should be getting better results at higher print speeds, where discrete steps of the motors start to coalesce into a single smooth motion, but except for diagonal and straight moves, I can't have both motors always going full tilt, obviously. On just slightly slanted lines, like on the hull of my bench sheet, one motor still has to go slow, and that's where we get artifacts. But let's try out and see what happens anyway, because I haven't yet tried to crank up print speeds. I'm gonna print the exact same pulley again, except at twice the size this time, and the speeds I'm increasing to nearly three times of what I used before. Looking at the sliced model though, unfortunately it seems like this still doesn't make it move any faster than 33 millimeters a second on the main gear, which is disappointing given my firmware locks out at 200. I guess this must be due to accelerations, I really have no experience printing fast. But in the G-code it looks like it's still going about twice as fast as before, so I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. That is faster and a little bit smoother. Oh yeah, we are getting extrusion issues again. There is some under extrusion. Because of course the extruder now also has to go a lot faster, so... I'm again hitting that point where the extruder just can't keep up and doesn't produce enough pressure on the filament. Layer shift and occasional under extrusion aside, gears this size could be deemed acceptable I guess. There's still the same weird thing going on with the teeth, but because they're so much bigger it has less of an impact on their shape. It's a shame, this whole resolution thing is so cursed because I'm relatively close but can't quite get there without physical modifications. I just can't really fix a mechanical issue of the motors and software, and even if I could, I would have an easier time doing it in hardware, because all I really need is to add a bit more speed reduction so the nozzle moves less distance for every full step of the motor. Half of what it does now would probably be acceptable, and a quarter decent. 
Okay, so to double check my claims here, I set it to quarter step mode as opposed to the half steps I was running before, and something very interesting I hadn't considered popped up. Micro stepping doesn't flat out not work at all on these motors, but it does kind of work a little bit at higher speeds, smoothing out motion, as you can hear from it not being as loud anymore. Which perfectly lines up with my explanation of why microstepping works in the first place. Ultimately, it's still no good though, because it switches from kind of working a little bit to doing full steps when the motors are trying to go slow. Plus, I'm now also getting the layer shift in all directions, what with microsteps having less torque. But it's very interesting nevertheless. There is two ways to go about improving this. I could either increase gear reduction, which I know you guys will love because it's totally in the spirit of rep rap. But this printer is obviously not very good at printing small gears yet. I don't really like 3D printed gears in general. And making an entire gear reduction from scratch seems like a lot of hassle compared to just slapping in threaded rod as a lead screw. Plus, to get down to a reasonable minimum resolution, both of those will make the printer equally slow, so I might as well pick the easier one. I already have those modifications sketched out in CAD. You can see the extruder is attached to the hot end, and we have the motor on the x-axis pushing the carriage via the lead screw. If I can get my hands on one, it'll be an imperial size because of the coarser thread so as not to make it super slow, higher pitch always needing less turns to advance the nut a certain amount. But having this much more speed reduction will also let me run those motors at maximum speed all the time, meaning they'll be much quieter as well since they don't pull around the carriages in those big, harsh steps anymore, making the entire printer vibrate. Next up, the heated bed. Using the glass itself as the only structurally bearing component was a reasonable idea because it actually stays really flat regardless of temperature, and the aluminum foil bed heater is probably the only way to get a heated bed of this size for really, really cheap, but drilling holes through the glass, further weakening those inherently fragile corners wasn't a smart move, as proven by the fact that I broke it. Taking a look at the crack, there's this short bit between hole and the edge that I discovered first, and the large one only appeared after I heated the bait up, so I must have broken this corner, and incidentally you can see it cracked at an angle, whereas all the rest of the crack seems to be perpendicular to the surface. And wouldn't you know it, if that leveling screw was in there and I happened to hit it sideways, it would put a twist on that corner, which could easily initiate this crack. Two of my awesome patrons, huge thank you by the way, everyone supporting these shenanigans, suggested making the hole bigger and installing a 3D printed grommet to cushion these impacts, and thank you for the idea, that's exactly what I'm going to do, as soon as I can print properly I guess. Better solution overall would be to not have drilled any holes in the first place, and just epoxy the screws to the glass, though I'm not entirely sure how well epoxy would take the heat, plus my bed heater would have to be reinvented, but I guess that's what I would try on my next 3D printer. Regarding my cable drive system on the X and Y axes, there's a few interesting things to mention as well. First and foremost, it's not reliable, and that's entirely my fault. When I discovered the cable drive in that typewriter, it served as my inspiration, and I really wondered, why isn't this amazing technique used anymore these days? It's so incredibly simple! Just use steel fishing line, wrap it around a driven cylinder, and BAM! You got a linear drive system without complicated parts like timing belts, pulleys, or idlers. Now that I've tried it, I have to say, from an economical standpoint, timing belts are probably more reliable in the long run, because cable drive isn't quite as easy as it looks. It's just that little bit finicky and high maintenance that makes it annoying. I first had my Y and then X axis fishing line break on several occasions, not just from overtensioning. Just like with bandsaw blades, you have to keep the minimum bending radius of the steel in mind, otherwise it'll fatigue and break, which definitely happens sooner than I expected it to. After replacing the Y-axis fishing line with two thinner ones, it now works great, but the X-axis is giving me a ton of layer shifting and broken lines on the regular. Guess what? The Benchy I printed in the last video, I had to do twice actually, because the first time around, the fishing line slipped off the drive drum and everything stopped moving, resulting in a nice spaghetti disaster. And that is entirely my fault. Basically, after I found out that microstepping wouldn't fix the poor resolution of my steppers, I didn't give a shit anymore and finished it the way it was planned, just to see what would happen. 
Well, now I know, and to do it properly, I would definitely have to make a new x-axis gear reduction with a bigger diameter drive drum so as not to bend the fishing line as tightly. And it definitely cannot have flanges constricting its movement up and down the drum. This is not to say you can't build a decent cable-driven 3D printer. I'm sure a well-made cable drive would work just as well as any belt, but it's not as easy as doing something and crossing your fingers for it to work. And since doing it properly in this case would be much more elaborate than installing lead screws, I'm quite happy to see the cable drive and the gear reductions go for the added simplicity. So last but not least, my biggest mistake by far, the V-Groove bearings. Back in episode 3 of this series, when I machined melted together bottle caps into V-groove sleeves for my bearings, nobody in the comments seems to have noticed a very obvious flaw in my design here, something that immediately went through my head after pressing in the bearings. Notice it? Yeah. If I can push in those bearings with just my thumb, couldn't they be pushed out just as easily? And oh boy, they do! If you take a close look at the Z-carriage, you'll notice some of the bearings are actually flush with the sleeve, even though originally they were slightly recessed. Just from a slight mismatch between the X-axis length and the distance of the Z-axis rails. But this really becomes an issue on the Y-axis, where the entire weight of the print bed rests on those rollers radially. Yes, over the course of a print, the bed gradually drops from the bearings, slipping down inside the rollers, even at different rates on every corner depending on just how tight of a fit that sleeve happens to have on the bearing, which if nothing else messes up bed level. Now that's not the end of the world yet, those sleeves are a millimeter thicker than the bearings, so with the sleeve protruding half a millimeter on each side, I could simply use a soldering iron to deform the plastic in order to lock those bearings in. Unfortunately, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You might also have noticed my V-rollers only have a single ball bearing, as opposed to the two like you see on those POM wheels everyone likes to use. I did that because I thought, two bearings that close together? What a freaking waste of a perfectly good bearing. With a 90 degree V-groove riding on a 90 degree rail, it's going to stabilize all by itself just from the tension on the roller. Unfortunately, reality doesn't care about theory, and while it does self-stabilize to a degree, and you can print with it at lower speeds no problem, it does not make for a rigid gantry. Combined with the slack in my bearings, it's actually pretty pathetic. You can see the rollers rock back and forth on the rail, enabled by the single bearing, allowing some significant deflection of the nozzle without me applying much pressure at all. But even that wouldn't be a huge issue if it wasn't for the final nail in the coffin. Absolute garbage quality bearings. You see, when you buy ball bearings, you can get different grades, with an ABEC rating between ABEC 1, ABEC 3, 5 through 9. ABEC 1 being the highest tolerance, least precise, and therefore, understandably, cheapest ones. And as it so happens, if you buy the cheapest possible ball bearings you can find on AliExpress, you'll end up with ABEC 1 or below. Honestly, these bearings are so incredibly bad, I doubt they even have a rating at all. Specifically, they're visibly imprecise in pretty much all dimensions. The sides have been cut at an angle, the ID is too large, and most importantly, the ball races have been machined in askew with respect to the axis of rotation. If I spin one up and apply some sideways pressure, it visibly wobbles. And that wobble is the problem, because it wobbles on the printer too. The bed moves up and down in kind of a wave motion as it travels back and forth. The X carriage does the exact same, turning every straight line into a wave at the hot end. But rather than talk about it, let me show you some actual measurements. Okay, I have my dial indicator attached to the X axis. I'm gonna sweep the bed across it, and you just watch that needle. Yeah, that's half a layer height in variance, which doesn't bode well for any larger first layers, does it? <laughs> Same thing again on the x-axis, this time the dial indicator has to be attached to the carriage itself because I need a straight reference which I'm providing with this aluminum U-channel.
I think you'll agree I have bigger problems than clipper and input shaping. But isn't it amazing this still manages to print calibration cubes that might as well have been printed on any other badly adjusted off the shelf printer. Okay, but for real now, I clearly need to fix this before even thinking about lead screws. The only reasonable solution would be to finally ditch my ridiculous $50 hard limit budget and install some proper POM wheels on there. But who would I be if I gave up that easily? Certainly not me, that's for sure. Now I'm already so deep down the rabbit hole, I feel like I kinda have to prove that I can make it work, even with those awful bearings, by just using the right kind of engineering. I need to make new, wider V-groove sleeves for two bearings each, identical to those off-the-shelf ones, because if you take a look at their cross-section, they don't just have a hole straight through, but a little ridge in the middle for the bearings to butt up against from each side, effectively locking that sleeve in between the bearings to prevent the exact issues I've been having. The problem is, these new sleeves with the ridge are a lot more difficult to machine, since I can't just stick them on the old motor shaft anymore, plus I'm legit starting to get tired of this project, and really don't feel like making another 20 rollers from scratch, so I think we're going to enlist help from our sponsor. PCBWay offers 3D printing services for a variety of processes, ranging from FDM to SLS and PolyJet. In my case, I think SLA resin printing would be best, because it allows for much more accurate features than FDM, which I kinda need for parts this small. So to order, I simply drop my STL for the finished V-Groove sleeve on their website, select the resin and other parameters like quantity. Submit that request and the quote will be adjusted in a manual review depending on complexity. Speaking of PCBWay, they actually sent me a Christmas present! If the pictures I've seen on X, aka Twitter, are true, there is some good stuff in there. Oh my gosh, this is amazing! I got a 2-in-1 pillow slash blanket, a keyboard wrist rest, a mouse pad, neck pillow, this huge thermos tumbler with a straw, a Christmas card, and a custom wax sealed envelope. Oh my god, it even has my handwritten name on it here! This amazing little plaque with my channel name on it, and PCB Christmas ornaments with flashing LEDs. I'm a sucker for those. Genuinely love it, it's awesome. Huge thanks to PCBWay for all this stuff, sponsoring the video, and saving me from having to turn another 20 identical V-Groove sleeves. So that's the noteworthy mistakes I made building this 3D printer. Of course, let's not be too harsh on myself, it's the very first time I dabbled in it, and when I designed this machine, literally all I knew about the entirety of 3D printing was the existence of Ender 3 and Prusa. Yet, the thing kinda works! So let's print a few parts for improving it to end the video on a good note. Of course I can't do anything overly susceptible to the layer shift, so for now I only have a few proper bay leveling knobs and an air duct for the part cooling fan. I spent quite a bunch of time painfully designing this duct here around the SketchUp model, but upon suggestion of a patron I'm gonna switch to a different one with tilted fan I found on Thingiverse. And unlike mine, this one is also flow optimized. Though if you don't care about sending the airstream around a 90 degree curve, I'm going to leave mine on my thingiverse in the description just in case it could be of use for someone out there. I'm going to slice it with a fan opening facing the left hand side, that way the only effect my constant layer shift should have is the fan angle being slightly reduced. Someone in the comments suggested compensating that layer shift with Clipper's skew correction, but I'm pretty sure that won't work because Clipper will move over entire layers to counteract, whereas my my hot end is continually drifting even within one layer, which makes the actual amount of layer shift I'm getting dependent on object size and the time each layer takes. That might have been asking a little bit much in terms of complexity. Or the printer is mad at me for exposing its weaknesses to the whole internet. In any case, it'll take quite a bit of cleanup to get that usable, although in all fairness, it is single perimeter walls in some places, so I'm not surprised it didn't turn out great. And FYI, before even getting this print started, the x-axis fishing line broke yet again, so believe it or not, I'll be quite happy to get rid of it. Since the bridging turned out quite messy, leaving me with holes where no air should escape, I'm going to fill those in by melting a failed first layer over it with a soldering iron set to 180 degrees. And actually, while I'm at it, I'll use that to straighten things out a bit in general. 
After a while of doing that, I guess there is not much left of the original print. I ended up reinforcing pretty much all the single perimeter walls as well. And because we all know I'm going to tear this all down again shortly, I'm gonna commit a criminal offense by hot gluing it to the fan, which also helps plug those atrocious gaps. And it kind of works. Not exactly the little dent it's supposed to be. The reverse ones clearly don't work properly because there's too much string in there. But it's better than nothing. That'll do the trick. I've obviously sunk into a new low. This probably shouldn't even be printed from PLA because of temperature resistance, let alone should I be using tons of hot melt glue to attach it right next to the nozzle, but whatever. Um... Shit. I guess there may have been a reason I didn't put the fan there originally. Uh, whatever, for testing now I'm just gonna work around it by clamping a piece of wood to the axis to trigger the end stop a bit sooner and shift the homing position. It'll offset the print by about 2 inches, but on a bait this size, who cares? So to try it out, I have these bait leveling knobs. They are tiny at like 7 minutes print time each, and because of that they should also be able to take full advantage of an improved part cooling, otherwise they might end up a little bit melty. Pretty good, I'd say. Whether that is thanks to the improved part cooling, I don't know, but it does have barely any layer shift from bottom to top, which is definitely because it's so small. So, same thing again three more times, I guess. In case you're wondering why I'm doing them all separately, well, if I did them in a single print, each layer would take four times as long, consequently I would end up with four times the layer shift. After cleaning up, it turns out the hex pocket is way too tight for the nut, so I'm going to blast the nut with the hot air gun until it's scalding hot, then feed it in nice and straight using the drill press like Naomi Wu's heat set insert press. These are to replace the hastily thrown together ones made out of wood, and for those of you guys who hate manual bed leveling, you're lucky you don't have to do it on this printer where the leveling knobs are practically inaccessible. like. It's really hard to level the bait on this one. I guess that's another small design flaw I forgot to mention. So, there we have it! This is kind of the dark side of the project. I definitely cut a few too many corners, among other to stay on schedule and keep pumping out videos, and since I sort of swept them under the rug in the process, by means of video being an inherently deceptive format, you think you've seen something, except you haven't. I really wanted to put some focus on these things now, even if it's a bad look for me. Because ultimately, mistakes is what we best learn from, and if you can learn from mine, that's a huge win. I mean, in my opinion, this video may very well have been the most important episode of the entire series. 3D printers are what they are for a reason, there is no point reinventing the V-Groove wheels, even if I didn't know that just two years ago. For all the improvements I just outlined, I'm gonna keep sticking to the $50 initial budget, because in for penny, in for pound I guess, but I will try to get it done in as few videos as possible, since I have new, bigger and more interesting projects coming up, like my fully enclosed laser engraver slash cutter that I've been designing for over a year now as well at this point, and unfortunately it won't be using V-Groove rollers made from bottle caps. That said, a very Merry Christmas, I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you again next year, which starts in a few weeks. Bye bye!